Hi, my name is Cameron Holdaway, and today I'll be talking about risk-taking in adversarial games. Many outcomes in life are uncertain and probabilistic, which makes risk an integral part of everyday life. Whether choosing to take a new route to work or putting up big money in a casino, accurately evaluating the riskiness of a decision is a crucial skill we face daily. There's a vast literature on the study of risk-taking. Most often, using lotteries or bandit tasks in which subjects choose between a safe option and a risky option with a more variable payoff. Interestingly, many biases and fallacies in risk-taking, such as the gambler's fallacy, seem consistent with a mistaken belief that a mechanical random process actually has sequential dependencies, or is non-stationary, as though it were generated more organically. Basically, people sometimes treat these stochastic machines as though they might change their strategy in response to previous outcomes. So what about instances when the source of risk actually does exhibit these more organic dependencies? In this project, we're interested in risk-taking in an adversarial context. Humans are social beings, and we spend much of our time making decisions based on how we think others will respond. For example, in The Princess Bride, uh, Vicini accepts the poison wine only because he thinks he's outsmarted Wesley. So whether conducting a business negotiation or engaging in a battle of wits, in these instances, the quality of a decision depends on how the other side responds. Studying risk in these adversarial games is interesting because the measure of risk is highly dependent on your opponent and explicitly defined in terms of their possible responses. So unlike a slot machine, an adversary's choice seems more controllable. It seems like we might trick an opponent and thus outmaneuver them. Risk taking in this domain is significantly less well studied perhaps because it requires a non-trivial setup sufficient to elicit strategic behaviors, as well as just requiring both parties to understand the game well enough to make informed risky choices. In this study, we proposed chess as an ideal lens through which to study risk-taking in adversarial settings. First, chess is highly strategic, with many possible actions in any given situation. It also has a well-defined scoring system and algorithms that can evaluate move quality and positional strength, making objective metrics more attainable. Also, chess is inherently adversarial, and who your opponent is matters a lot when you're choosing a strategy. Players may elect to use risky gambits to sacrifice pieces for positional advantage, or lay a trap for an unsuspecting foe. In this project, we use chess as a testbed for studying risk-taking in adversarial games. We'll first present a new algorithm for measuring risk in chess and apply it to a massive empirical dataset to understand cognitive processes underlying risk in chess. Because chess is complex, previous attempts to study risk-taking in chess were limited only to the opening move, classifying openings as risky or not based on how often they resulted in tied games. Essentially, these studies classify an entire game's riskiness based solely on the outcome of games that started with that move. So here with the uh, king's pawn or the queen's pawn, these are ostensibly very similar moves, but they are classified as risky or not risky um, in these studies based on their tie percentage. But this approach neglects the rich, complex dynamics that take place within a game. So how can we evaluate the riskiness of any given move? In order to move beyond this very limited view of risk in chess, we propose a measure of riskiness calculated as the weighted variance of possible opponent responses. So to be clear, for any given white move, we'll look at all the black responses over, uh, ever made to that move. Some may be good for white and some may be bad. We then take the weighted variance of these scores and call that riskiness, call that the riskiness of White's move. Thus, to calculate this riskiness, as you can see, we need to know the empirical distribution of each of the possible opponent responses and how good or bad that might be. Uh, you might be able to tell that chess has a massive branching factor around 35, and there are more possible board configurations than atoms in the universe. So in order to even begin to do this, we need a lot of data. Thankfully, Chess is a very popular game. To get an empirical distribution of each move and the possible responses, we scraped over 1 billion online games from 2013 to 2020. Each game consists of dozens of moves, resulting in billions of different board configurations. The resulting dataset is orders of magnitude larger than any other recent large-scale studies using chess and absolutely dwarfs the amount of data you would get in a traditional lab setting. So I'll break down some important pieces of this graph to just explain how we made sense of all this data. So each node in the graph is a board state, starting with the root node. For example, these boards differ in white's initial pawn move. We again have the, uh, the queen's pawn and the king's pawn moving to the, the fourth square. So here we show the move played. 
and each node has an accompanying count of the number of times it appears in the data set. So these are two very popular openings. And each node also has an associated evaluation score. This is calculated using the Stockfish algorithm. The details aren't super important for this, but basically it's a superhuman chess playing algorithm that can evaluate each position for its relative strength. So the D4 move on the left is viewed as neutral, whereas E4 is advantageous for white. Finally, we can calculate the weighted variance of each move, and this is our measure of riskiness. This is calculated by taking each of the possible responses the opponent could make and weighing the resulting score uh, by its probability. So intuitively, a move where there are only two outcomes, half the time the opponent will take my queen, and the other half they'll lose the game, that would be a very risky move. So now that we have a measure of riskiness for all the moves in all our games, we can start to ask questions about how risk preferences change as a function of the opponent, the state of the game, and past performance. First, we ask whether the skill of the player and their opponent influences their risk preference. This graph shows the mean log risk on the y-axis and the binned player skill level on the x-axis. Player skill is calculated using a zero-sum scoring system called ELO, which is very popular for other sports and other games. Um, novices have an ELO below 1200, and players above 2000 are considered very skilled. We see that, on average, weaker players consistently play riskier than experts. The average across all groups is shown in this red line. So we saw that experts play more risk averse, but a unique aspect of risk taking in adversarial games is that strategy might change depending on who they're playing. So do they change their strategy based on the skill of their opponents? Here we show a plot with each player's skill on the x-axis and their opponent's skill on the y-axis. Lighter colors reflect riskier play, and if players adapt their style depending on their opponent, then we would see sy systematic changes in the coloring of this plot. And that's exactly what we see. So let's break this down a little bit. Players in the middle skill level show a clear trend of playing riskier against weaker players. The lighter colors near the bottom, and they play more risk averse against strong opponents, with darker colors near the top. To the right, experts, however, tend to play fairly consistently regardless of the opponent as evidenced by fairly consistent color from top to bottom. On the left, novices, however, seem to play extremely risky in almost all cases. So I think this may indicate that the risk is actually just more erratic ignorance than a calculated strategy, but we would need more uh, evidence to confirm that. So in summary, we do see evidence that riskiness varies based on the skill and that most players play riskier against weaker opponents and less risky against strong opponents. Next, we ask whether players' risk tolerance changes as a function of the state of the game. So in this plot, we are now showing the game score on the x-axis. So score is calculated in centipons, which means plus 500 player is in a very strong advantageous position, and a player at minus 500 is losing very badly. Again, we show the log risk on the y-axis. And in this plot, we'll also show the average risk taken in blue, just as before, but we'll also show the maximum risk available for each uh, move in gray. As you can see, the gray bars are fairly stable. So the amount of risk available to a player is, uh, the, so the amount of risk that they could have undertaken is constant, but the actual average risk varies greatly. You see this U-shaped pattern. Notably, when a player is in an advantageous position, they seem to play riskier. And this is consistent with the house money effect observed in poker, which is basically playing fast and loose with surplus money. Notably, this isn't a priori obvious, though. So, for example, in a sports game, teams that are leading late in the final period may adopt a much more risk-averse strategy um, in an attempt to preserve the lead. Similarly, when, playing, when a player is trailing, they tend to play much riskier. This is consistent with a break-even strategy, where basically any chance to make up lost ground seems more attractive. In close games, players tend to adopt a more risk-averse strategy, despite the total amount of risk that they could adopt being just as high as in any other situation. So some of this may be the product of people following a common theoretical opening. However, these effects do persist even when controlling for the move number in the game. So it's not just that they're playing standard opening procedure. So to recap, we see that people play riskier when leading or trailing, consistent with house money and break-even theories of risk. While we observe that players tend to play riskier when trailing, we now specifically look at risk preference with respect to the previous moves. First, uh, note that since scoring is based on a comparison between the move chosen and the optimal move chosen by Stockfish, which is the superhuman algorithm, the best score for a move in this case is zero. 
So with that in mind, we first define a blunder as a move evaluated at minus 100 or below. The exact definition of a blunder varies within the chess community, but these are pretty bad mistakes, representing at least a lost piece or a significant positional loss. In these plots, the x-axis represents the evaluation of the player's previous move. So a minus 400 uh, means the player's last move was pretty terrible, and thus classified as a blunder. And in the plot um, above here, we show the distribution of moves by their evaluation. So about 16% of the moves played are classified as blunders. In the figure below, we plot the log risk taken on the current move, uh, that's the y-axis there, binned by the evaluation of the player's previous move on the x-axis. We see that when players' previous move was bad, so that's red, those are blunders, their next move tends to be much riskier, and this effect persists even when controlling for the player's strength and the move number. So finally, we find evidence that players adopt a compensatory risk strategy, basically a gamble to make up for previous mistakes. Um, you could basically think of this as the what do I have to lose approach to risk taking. So far we've only classified the riskiness of a move. In future work we want to expand these analyses to answer questions about whether risk taking is actually optimal, meaning it represents a good trade-off between risk and reward. We also view these results as a good launchpad into risk taking behavior in other naturalistic settings. For example, is increased risk taking following a blunder borne out in other domains such as stock trading, sports, or poker? Thanks so much for listening. Uh, also, special thanks to my lab mates in the UCSD Computational Cognition Lab, and feel free to check us out on GitHub.